Now you notice that every single time I do that, the actual point of origin for those sparks is wherever I place that rod. So by not moving this knife, my sparks are gonna originate from that edge down to my tinder bundle. So I just move this to orient it over the tinder bundle wherever I need to, to get my sparks to land on the actual tinder to accept that spark. Hey everybody, this is Josh here, the Gray Bearded Green Beret. Just wanted to revisit something that I have not done a video on for several years. I did, uh, I think the last time I did dedicated videos on using ferro rods was was a few years ago. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I think because it's been so long uh, since I've talked about that, I kind of revisit, revisit that uh, for the benefit of everyone and really how to process tinder resources for that matter, because really, you know, the, the, the ferro rod is one thing, it's an ignition source, but if you don't have an actual properly processed fuel resource, a tinder resource to accept the heat from that, it doesn't matter what technique you use, you need more experience over here. So I wanna kind of talk about both of those uh, in this and revisit that and give you all the tools you need in your toolbox to know everything there is to know about ferrocerium rods. Ferrocerium rods, also known as ferro rods, uh, they work by, these are made of pyrophoric metals, uh, iron being one of them, uh, cerium being another, uh, as well as probably about, depending on which one you have, you know, anywhere is around 4% magne magnesium. So pyrophoric metals inside here, you take a harder scraper, in this case, we're using a steel scraper to remove that pyrophoric metal off of there. That rapid oxidation happens, you get that spark. And if there's proper tinder to accept that spark, you're gonna be able to achieve an actual fire. And then of course, you gotta have the rest of the fire train going. You gotta have your, your, your tinder to your kindling to your sustaining fuel and all that. But this part I wanna focus on just the ferro rod. And you know, I'm not primarily a YouTuber, uh, even though I do enjoy doing videos on this platform. Uh, I'm primarily a physical instructor. So I teach physical classes across the United States and, and really help people develop their wilderness skills and enjoy themselves with their families out in the wilderness. That's my primary focus. So the only way for me to teach out of a position of experience is by being experienced. So I have, a lot of research and development, a lot of time, a lot of effort goes into making sure I know exactly what I'm talking about. And I know a variety of different rods because I don't know what a student's gonna show up with at one of my courses. Whatever they show up with is my responsibility as a professional instructor to get them successful with the particular rod that they show up with. Uh, so I've got a selection uh, that I like to carry, which are Uber Liebens. Uh, I think that the consistency, the softness of these are the best ones that are on the market. And then I also have some smaller rods from Light My Fire, uh, which I think are probably the best small rods out there. But they're very, very different rods. And I'm gonna show you why that matters here in just a second. Now there are also four different techniques for using a ferro rod that I wanna go over with you. And the one that you choose depends on two things really. It depends on what type of ferro rod you're using. It's like a really good set of wind chimes. What type of ferro rod you're using and also the tinder that you're trying to use to accept the spark from this. Now the first technique is what I call the pin and pull method. And this is my preferred technique. This is where I get the, you know, the rule that I've said since the beginning when I started making these videos is, you know, if it takes you more than three strikes with a ferro rod to get your tinder lit, there's something either wrong with your technique or there's something wrong with your tinder. And you need to address one or both of those rather than sit there and waste the resource. Uh, because there is a technique involved in this and you know i like larger ferro rods i like about a half inch or so as far as diameter and i like them to be five to six inches long because that gives me the most efficient removal of material with every single stroke these come with you know supplied strikers to me that's a backup striker i like to use the actual spine of my knife not the edge because the edge will dull over time if you do that i like to use the spine of my knife the point of leverage on the knife based on where i'm holding it is right up here close to the handle, right? That's where it's strongest. That's where I'm gonna get the most pressure. That's where I'm gonna get what I need. Out here, you get a little bit of flex in the knife. It relies on your grip strength a little more. Point of leverage is right here. Orientation is blade away from me on the rod. What I'll do with that is pin that striker, in this case, my knife, tilt the blade angle forward. And I'm gonna take the actual ferro rod. In this case, this is a hexa. This is a hexagonal ferro rod that I like. Still half inch diameter, still five inch. I really like this. It's got a nice flat surface on it, which is what you'll achieve after you've used the ferro rod like one of these 
for a long period of time, you'll get that flat surface. You'll get that flat surface and you can really scrape off a lot of that pyrophoric metal, dump it into your tinder. Now, for the pin and pull technique, I pin the striker, in this case the knife, get my purchase up here at the point of leverage, not out here, point of leverage, and I'm going to pull the rod without moving the striker. Now you notice that every single time I do that, the actual point of origin for those sparks is wherever I place that rod. So by not moving this striker, not moving this knife, my, my sparks are gonna originate from that edge down to my tinder bundle. So I just move this to orient it over the tinder bundle wherever I need to, to get my sparks to land on the actual tinder to accept that spark. So that's the hexa. I'm getting around, let me do a little landscaping here. That's with the hexa. All of those sparks are going exactly where I want them to go, down onto the tinder. And they're burning for quite an extended period of time right there. That's what I want. I don't want this, you know, kind of limp-wristed nonsense here. Pin it, friction, pull. I do the same thing if I'm using the, I believe this is a Craftig 5-inch pin, pull. Nice and controlled. In the winter time, I like to go with this eight inch, same thing, eight inch ferro rod, but I can get more material with each stroke and it's a lot easier to use with gloved hands. And that stuff that's still spark and still burning on the ground, that's gonna be happening inside your tinder bundle. If your tinder bundle is processed correctly, it's gonna work. And then you have this little fatty that I like to keep because it's a little bit shorter uh, but it fits inside my belt pouch a lot better. So I like that one as well. And this rod is a little softer consistency than the other Uber Levens I carry, uh, but there is technique to that that you need to know. So pin and pull technique with the larger Uber Levens, that's the best way to go. Softer rod, larger ferro rod, big tinder bundle to accept that. That's the best method to use, the most efficient. Again, if it takes you more than three strikes with this, there's something wrong with your technique or there's something wrong with your tinder and you need to fix one or both of those before you continue to waste that resource. Let's talk about fatwood. Fatwood is a natural tinder. This fatwood can be found in a variety of different conifers. I'm typically finding it in pines, but I've also found it in cypress down in Florida. Depends on what area of the country you're in. Fatwood is a natural tinder that you can use to easily accept the spark using the pin and pull method. Your basic tinder bundle incorporates three different sizes of material. You've got coarse, you've got medium, and you've got fine material. That's your baseline, that's your basic tinder bundle. And when processed properly, you'll be able to get that lit within one to three strikes with a ferro rod every single time. On the other hand, if it's damp or marginal tinder, then I recommend that you add some sort of wet weather tinder like fatwood that's a natural tinder that works well when wet place it in the center of your tinder bundle. That will accept the spark a lot easier. And then once that's burning, that will dry out the rest of that damp marginal tinder and get it going. Here are two examples of bundles that are made of straight tulip poplar bark. It's straight tulip poplar, straight inner bark tinder. The first is pretty coarsely processed. It really doesn't have enough medium material and it really doesn't have any fine material. It's mostly coarse, so it's poorly processed. I'm still able to get it within three strikes. It's just, I could have got it within one had I taken the time to process that correctly. The second example is the same material. It's, it's tulip poplar bark again, but it's properly processed. No fat wood, no birch bark, no flash tinder, nothing. One strike on natural tinder, properly processed using the pin and pull method. You may be thinking everything you've shown is in dry conditions. What about when it's wet outside. Well, going back to what I said, if it's wet outside, add a wet weather tender to that basic tender bundle. Uh, just understand that when it's wet outside, your conditions are not exactly that great as far as getting that one to three strike rule. But if you process your tender properly, you'll still be able to do it most likely, but it may take you three strikes instead of one. 
because the conditions are damp. So what I recommend you do is add that fat wood to the bundle, that basic bundle, and then start your fire. When that fat wood is burning or that birch bark, if that's what you have, depending on what area you're in, that fat wood or that birch bark will burn long enough to dry the surrounding tinder in your tinder bundle out and catch. And then you'll get your, your, your actual ignition started with your ferrocerium rod. Same thing goes with wet conditions like snow covered conditions. You know, I typically use the pen and pull method with natural tinder, like a birch bark, like the birch cone that I teach in my winter skills when I'm up in the Northeast. Having a lot of experience with a variety of different tenders is extremely important because when I'm in wet conditions, I'm going to look for fatwood because it's a wet weather tender. When I'm in snow covered conditions, I'm going to look for birch bark because birch bark is another wet weather tender that will burn when wet. So it's, a, it's more a knowledge of tender, how they react to different ignition sources and how to properly process them to accept the heat from the ignition source you're using. That's more important a lot of times than the actual technique. The other reason that I prefer the pin and pull technique as the primary way that I teach, that directly translates to one-handed ferrocerium rod techniques for the injured survivor. And if we're talking about survival techniques and we're considering ourselves survival instructors and teaching skills that are valuable in a survival situation, then we have to think about contingencies. We have to think about one of the main reasons someone may be in that situation to begin with is because they're injured, you know? So being limited to a technique that requires both hands and not being useful for that injured survivor that only has one, te one arm to use is not the best way to go about it. There's different techniques, there's different ways to use them. The burden is on the professional instructor to look at all the different techniques, find the value, find the applicability for a person before he dismisses them. Here on YouTube and during my courses, I teach several different methods of one-handed techniques for the injured survivor because it's a plausible contingency that really needs to be addressed. It needs to be practiced before it's needed. Ooh, a 10. <sighs> the A-10 brings me back to a happy place. One-handed techniques for an injured survivor is a plausible scenario. It's a plausible situation that needs to be practiced before it's needed. And, you know, that's something that my students have no problem duplicating as well. One to three strikes with a ferro rod with one hand. That's really one of the reasons that I really like the Carbon Garberg. It has the exposed tang, that, that exposed butt on the end with the 90 degree. That's great for processing tinder, but it's also great But it's also great for striking a ferro rod with one hand. That's why when I designed the GB2 Puko, I incorporated that because I thought that was such an outstanding feature for this particular scenario. Got a little sunshine now, I almost wanna move and go soak up some sun, but we'll keep dragging on. All right, so what about these smaller rods, right? This, these smaller rods tend to be a harder composition. So I like to use a different technique with these. I like to use the thumb assist technique right and that is one where I'll actually use the supplied striker and when you look at these strikers you need to look and find where that burr is because there is a right way and a wrong way to handle these you can hold them a different way and the burr is not there it'll just kind of slide along the ferro rod without gripping in but it does have a burr there is a certain way to hold it on most of these so check yours but what I like about the thumb assist technique these are smaller rods you know so I'm trying to only use the very end of it, you know, probably like that last quarter of an inch at the most. With the thumb assist technique, hold the striker, get your purchase right there, get that point right at the very end, sorry, right at the very end. Same way I'm angling a knife, but I'm putting it right there and I'm using my thumb to put downward pressure. I'm pushing down on that to really get it to bite in and then I'm flicking that. To kind of direct sparks. Not a lot of sparks compared to these larger ones, but I think of these larger ones as kind of a shotgun blast and these smaller ones are kind of a sniper rifle, right? This is a precise placement of sparks onto a specialty tender like a pile of fatwood or a pile of birch bark shavings or something to that effect. A uh, Some charred material, you know, something that's a small target I'm gonna use something like this if I have it, uh, but that's what it's best for. Now, can you use 
this type of small rod using the pin and pull technique. Of course you can. It's just with each strike, even if I'm using the entire surface of this smaller ferro rod, with each strike, I'm not gonna remove as much material as I will if I'm using a larger rod like this one. So yes, you can still pin that striker and pull and get sparks. But that is not as much sparks compared to one of these larger ones where I pin and pull. So think of these as your shotgun blast with a lot of sparks hitting a general basic tender bundle. And think of these as the sniper rifle that hits that precise small target inside a basic tender bundle. So again, pit and pull method, large ferro rod, softer composition, medium composition. It's best for that. Think of this as the shotgun blast on a big ball of tinder, a big bundle of tinder. Little guys, harder composition. I like to use the thumb assist method and this is best for hitting that little target. This is the shotgun, this is the sniper rifle. Let's talk feather sticks really quick. There's really three reasons uh, that I can think of that you need a feather stick for. One is in wet conditions, you, know, you can do what's called a one stick fire. And basically you're getting to, you know, you're taking a larger piece of fuel and it's wet on the outside. So you're processing that down further so that you can get sonic booms. So you process it down further so you can get to the dry wood on the inside. And typically if you have wet conditions like that, sometimes it can be difficult to find dry natural tinder, even though typically where I'm at, I don't have any problem. It's always up underneath trees, it's up off the ground, it's being windswept. Uh, but you can create tinder from a kindling resource like this small stick. What you're doing is taking your knife and you're feathering it up to kind of increase the surface area and, and make it more coarse, medium, and fine so that it's, ex it's an acceptable tinder resource. So you're, you're basically using it to get to the wet wood in the center and you're taking that larger fuel resource, that kindling resource, and processing it down to where it's a suitable tinder. So that's one reason. Second reason is you don't have any really other natural tinder resource that you could use like an inner bark or an outer bark or uh, dried grasses and flower tops or you know something to that effect. So maybe that's not abundant in your area. So you're creating tinder from kindling resources using feather sticks. So that's really the other reason. Uh, the third reason that I see most often is, uh, you know, it's, it's a display of knife skills. So you're, you're, you're doing it for an Instagram post. Okay. Uh, and I do agree that it is a display of knife skill because it does show control. It shows that you know how to, you know, manipulate wood, follow ridges and produce suitable tinder, uh, from a less than suitable piece of kindling. Uh, so, and this is a small example. I like to use larger ones so I can get longer curls, but the key component of a feather stick, uh, if you're going to use it as a tinder is you have to create fine enough curls that'll easily accept the ignition source. Honestly, uh, a, a feather stick, the best ignition method for that is a lighter. Same thing. It's, it's more of an open flame tinder resource in my opinion especially if you're really trying to get a fire going really quickly, you're gonna quickly make out a non-Instagram worthy feather stick and you're gonna hit that with open flame, get your fire going. Typically one is not enough. You need probably about three stacked together. That's the way I do it. Uh, but if, as far as display of knife skills go, and you could use a lighter, you could use matches, you could use something like that, but an open flame ignition source is what these are best used for. Doesn't mean that you can't do it with a ferro rod and you know as far as students go and as far as the teaching point of it is and as far as you know using this for knife skills during wilderness skills i teach basic knife skills using the tri stick when they do the tri stick they make feathers and those feathers need to be suitable enough you know kind of the test of those feathers and kind of the test of that skill uh, as far as a knife skill is whether or not you can make these feathers suitable to accept a spark from a ferrocerium rod, even though that's not the best way to light them. Uh, it's, it's, it's a test of skill kind of thing. So uh, typically when I make a feather stick off of my tri-stick, when I'm doing my, my round reduction or my square reduction, I'll take the time to actually practice my feathers and then I'll test those feathers with a ferro rod because that's really what a tri-stick is, is, a, is practice. 
I've even gotten these to the point to where you can light, you know, feathers with a ferrocerium rod uh, that are still green. So it can be done. Uh, and that's really a good test of your knife skills. But if, if you can't get your feathers lit fairly easily within one to three strikes with the ferrocerium rod, then you're probably not very good at feather sticking and you need to work on that. Now let's talk about the third technique. And I saved this one for last because I really don't teach this one. I think this is probably the least efficient uh, method of doing it. I think it's the most wasteful of this resource. And I really only teach it as a way to help that beginner, that novice that doesn't really have a lot of experience, help him get a little bit of success right off the bat as he's developing the skill, as he or she is developing the skill, you know, to actually process tinder well and actually develop that single technique to where they can get that bundle lit within one to three strikes. So I call it the push and pray technique. Basically, I only break this out when someone's struggling. Uh, maybe they're struggling with their technique, their, their processing of tinder, or in conditions where it's it's damp tinder. I've also used this, but this is actually a good technique for that damp tinder when you don't have a wet weather tinder to use. It's a good way to kind of dry out the tinder in that particular area where you're hitting it with the sparks so that it can actually catch and then that heat from that will actually dry out the tinder next to it and kind of start that chain reaction. So it, it does have its place, uh, but I think it's the I think it's probably the, the most wasteful of the resource and the less, least desirable technique that I like to see. So for the push and pray technique, really what you're doing is you're, you're making up for good technique, good tender choice, good processing of tender. But, you know, sometimes this is what you're down to. So with that technique, you know, you kind of pin the rod to your tender and you just kind of go rapidly back and forth. And I'm creating a lot of heat in that area, but I'm also wasting a lot of this resource because I'm trying to overcome poor tinder processing or poor tinder choice and actually, and a little bit of poor technique, but I can overcome that by just blasting it with heat right here. But I'm wasting a lot of that resource. You know, it would be, if I process this properly, added a little wet weather tinder, a little knowledge of tinder resources and processing, I could easily hit that low and controlled and get that marginal tender going. But if somebody's really struggling, what I'm gonna do is show them this technique. And then after they get some success with that fire, then we'll talk about, you know, tender choices, tender processing, get them a little more experienced. But I like to have people have success. So that's a good technique for that. I've also used that technique in feather sticks in the past. The latest feather stick video I did, feather sticks and ferro rods actually show where you pin that to the feather stick and actually use that technique to get it lit. So that is a technique, uh, but again, that's not my preferred. That's not the way I show people to use it unless they're really, really struggling and I need to kind of throw the training wheels on, if you will. The fourth technique I call the, I don't even remember what it's called. That's how much I use it. I only teach it in the context of what not to do. Uh, this is the pin and push method is what I call it. It's where you pin the tender down and you push your striker towards the tender. The reason that I teach that only in the context of what not to do is because if I'm pushing this forward, if my tender bundle is here, as soon as I hit that tender bundle, I'm either gonna knock it away and scatter it, or I'm going to smash the tender bundle. Heat, fuel, and air, the fire triangle. If I smash that tender bundle, I've taken away the air and it's less ready to accept the heat from that ignition source. So I don't want to smash the tinder bundle. I don't want to smash the start of any tiny flame, which I've seen students do time and time again using that technique. They'll get a little bit of a flame that starts and then they hit it with the striker and it smashes it out. Uh, it's just not the best way to do it. Uh, another thing that I see people do is bang their knuckles all the time if they're putting it on an anvil like a stump or something that effect. So pin and push technique, I only teach that in the context, in the context of what not to do. So with that said, grab your ferro rods. There's no such thing as advanced techniques. There's only brilliance in the basics. Grab your ferro rods, head out to the forest with your family this weekend, enjoy yourself, make some fires, practice those techniques. Figure out what kind of ferro rod you have, whether it's hard, whether it's soft, which technique is the best for each. Practice with different resources, practice with a bunch of different tenders so you, no matter what you have in front of you at the time, when you need to make that fire, you'll know exactly what to do. There's no substitute for actual experience. Get outside, take your family, enjoy yourself. Hope to see you in the woods.